Hello. Hey, hey, how's it going? Hey, Chris? there he is. <laughs> are you ready? <laughs> How are you guys? Very good, thanks, and very, you? very well. Gareth, Craig, nice to see you both. Yeah, you too, Lovely man. To uh, you. Thank you so much for joining us. <laughs> sure, sure. Is my audio okay for you guys? But it sounds perfect. Are yeah, you? like really, really loudly. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> yeah, yeah. All right, we're good. Okay. Um, okay, we are we are live and good to go, Houston. <laughs> I love to tell stories. I love to talk about medicinal plants. I have a long background in yoga and meditation and, you know, chasing all of that around the world, too. So I'm pretty open. Cool. Yeah, and I like one... I like what you guys are doing. By the way, I really I like your site. Uh, I like the messages you're putting out. That's great. That's great. Thank you. That's Thank really you. kind really of you. Really appreciate that. That's we just job. feel that like people like yourself that are doing positive work in the world, uh, you know, we need to speak to more people like that. You know, that are just creating communities and improving people's lives as a whole. Uh, that's what it's all about. You know, and so we're just trying to find those stories and document them really. <laughs> And it's great. Yeah, 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 yeah. Sure, sure. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, um, we can all learn from each other. Yes. No, uh, I believe it's Indian. Uh, my oh. wife's my wife, Zoe, has a few very large and uh, remarkably heavy uh, cabinets <laughs> of, of, the, of this type. And uh, we have them. We have them in strategic places in the house. Yeah, it's really nice. It's really nice. And if it's you ever actually... need to block a door, you can just put one of those behind it. <laughs> oh yeah. Oh yeah. We we could stop an entire uh, Navy <laughs> SEAL force for sure. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> yes. What, what a, a chat, man. David. Flip. That was good. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Super nice guy. Hey. What a nice bloke, bud. Like. Yeah, bud. I thought the same thing. I was like, we need to go on a trip. That's, with him you know, yeah that was a what gift a... chat eh? yes man he was such we definitely a... could have spoken for flipping three hours with us okay but Easy. totally but... Ooh. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> Gareth, how's it going my man how are you buddy <laughs> Very awesome, man. How, how about you? You've had a bit of internet trouble this morning, uh, getting everything sorted out? Yes, but it's what a mission. It's amazing how much we rely <laughs> on it. Hey? And uh, yeah, it was crazy. I was doing all this work this morning. And then just as you and I get on a call, like my media, my my internet provider just like goes <laughs> and cancels everything. <laughs> like, oh, well. Oh, so. man. The joys of uh, podcasting uh, in uh, across Skype. It's. Uh, yeah fraught to danger <laughs> yeah, tell me about it but yeah and you man how's morning how, been yeah it's been good really good besides all that little um palaver how about your day bud yeah really good i just uh got home and just excited to have a chat uh and a good introduction to our uh, guest of this week uh chris killam the the medicine hunter himself what a what an interesting and awesome guy hey Yes, what an amazing guy. Seriously, he's super interesting. Like, Chris is like probably one of the, the best storytellers I've ever sort of heard. You know, just when he came onto the chat, he had this massive smile and it just yeah. kind of made you like <laughs> want to listen to him. And then he has this voice that just like, I don't know, projects sort of calmness and like you just like yeah. really feel like you want to listen to him. And, you know, Chris is um, somebody who basically promotes uh, natural plant-based medicines and you know as as part of that he is somebody that has a real loving and longing to protect the environment you know and not just the environment but also to support like indigenous cultures where a lot of these medicines come from and yeah, he his story is rather phenomenal and he opened up our eyes and ears to a lot of like fascinating facts about plant medicines. Um, didn't he, bud? And uh Yes. Yeah, and you know, like we've obviously tried some plant medicines in our lives and, <laughs> <laughs> and we've quite hundred have... percent. You know, first of all, that he is just such an engaging guy and, and you you can't just help you can't help yourself having a smile on your face when you listen to him. And I, and I, I think our listeners are really going to enjoy this chat. Um, and yeah, I mean, the, our, our experimentation with plant medicine was 
crude and uh, uninformed as as youth that we were. And I mean, I remember the one day we uh, a friend of mine we we missed school, we bunked school, and he had he had found this marijuana from a from a friend I don't know where or how and he had read this thing that if you boil it in milk or something like that that you'd extract THC from it and <laughs> we drank this cupful of this of this <laughs> foul tasting milky marijuana mix and like 20 minutes later we were like oh it doesn't work you know whatever and not long after that uh, I've it sort of turned into an afternoon of extreme paranoia and <laughs> highness <laughs> that we were going to get busted. <laughs> and, uh, and I proceeded to literally think that, that I was never going to be normal again. And uh, luckily, by the time my parents got home, uh, it was okay. But I mean, we were naughty little kids and and uh and you know probably it was really wrong and it was Ill highly illegal obviously but uh you know that's what that's what some people did in in in, <laughs> in my where i grew up and i'm sure you've had experiences as well hey yeah for sure look i don't think it's like you know something that's uncommon for kids to have that little bit of curiosity and and try things and and go through those rebellious mm -hmm. stages you know what i mean like yeah. i i certainly remember having a, a rebellious stage for a couple of years and one of those times was like you know we're, we're trying to like smoke cigarettes and, and i hated that i reckon i had maybe like two and i was like i can't do this stuff and then um the one time uh, or a few times you know my mates and i would go on holiday and and smoke some weed and you know like think we were really cool and whatnot and um you know but I can't say I like really loved it ever and then but I <laughs> do remember one of those times like I came back from holiday and one of my school teachers he was like he was like my um water polo coach a guy called Mr. Kiddo and uh, he called me like between classes and he met me like on the school bridge and he's like Gareth I've heard that uh, you know you, on your holiday that you were <laughs> you were smoking um, marijuana with your friends and stuff, and it's really bad, and you mustn't do it. And I was petrified like that, and I didn't know how he found out. So I was like, "How did this guy find out?" About, you know what I mean? And it was <laughs> so, so yeah, that was like one of my experiences, and it's just like it was so like I guess forbidden, not really forbidden, but like you know it wasn't it was frowned upon maybe um but everyone was still doing it so it's yeah, just totally. part of growing up <laughs> i think there was a generation before us that you know dacha they would say yeah, dacha is, dacha. it's like so bad for you and and it's like makes it makes you crazy and stuff like that and there was a real like you know it's okay to drink as much as you want but but don't smoke dacha you know and that, that was like that that mentality but you know uh, that's one thing that we really enjoyed about this chat with Chris is that he demystifies a lot about marijuana itself uh, and the the medicinal side of of uh, ma marijuana, uh, the oils extracted from marijuana, and all the other, literally like hundreds of other uses for for hemp and, and derivatives from from uh, from marijuana itself, its seeds even, um, and there's there's so much more to it and. Um, it's quite incredible to hear what he has to say about the, the health benefits from the cannabinoids and whatever else uh, that may be inside of it. And, and it was really eye-opening. And it was, it's a lot different to the sort of that idea of it's forbidden and bad. It, it, there's so much good about it too. And, and that's one aspect that uh, I think is definitely eye-opening to a lot, will be eye-opening to a lot of people here. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I mean, you know, just to say one thing on that he's, he basically says at some point in the future uh, that he reckons cannabis will be recognized as the most versatile medicine in the world and and that's super interesting you know this is a guy he's flipping as genuine as they come and he's obviously studied mm. it and sort of you know given almost his whole life to you know studying these plant medicines um so uh, that's really really interesting and um you know the the demything and debunking was was really an important part of the chat um and the other really cool thing was like you know just i guess the sense of adventure and exploration that you know he is sort of 
um, undertaken himself in his life. You know, he's visited over like, I don't know, 40 countries and mm. all these crazy like indigenous tribes and cultures and really immersed himself, you know, in them to sort of understand how they operate, you know, what they use in terms of like, you know, food and medicines um, that just mm. are around them in abundance in nature. And that was like such a cool part of it. And then, you know, the other part was also um, him basically, yeah, going into these cultures, you know, and just finding out like what it is that's, that's still out there in the world that we can actually bring into, I guess, our sort of more first world um, way of living. And there's so much stuff out there, isn't there, that, that can be of benefit to us. Yeah, yeah, totally. And and I think part of his role was just to discover new things. Uh, and his persona and his personality and, and just the way about Chris is one of listening and engaging with people. And that's what it's all about, is being open to th these ideas that, we don't have all the answers yet. And in actual fact, modern medicine is often just a derivative from all those herbal medici medicines that have been used for thousands and thousands of years. And now we're just finding out what their active ingredients are. But if you sit down with the shamans and the, you know, the, the, the grannies and the, the older people, sometimes they, they really know this stuff. Like they just, Oh, just go and find that root and use some of that for this, this and that. And, and off you go, you know, and so I just think it's it's a, a wonderful example of of you know being uh, aware that there's so much more out there than we than we may uh, you know know at this stage and 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 be open to those ideas from others, and not just what we sort of are aware of in the West, especially because there's so much more out there. So um, I think this is a good time to to go in ahead and and listen to uh, what what makes Chris kill him. Uh, the medicine hunter, ridiculously human. Well, uh, good afternoon there, Chris Killam. Um, how's it going, my man? Thank you very much for joining us on the Ridiculously Human podcast. Oh, I'm so happy to be on with both of you, Gareth and Craig. It's just a pleasure. I was grousing around on your website, and I like the messages you're putting out, and I'm happy to be part of that for sure. Oh, man, that's yeah, so awesome. cool. Uh, like... Literally, like the first time we saw your face in person, yeah, like on the Skype, you had this <laughs> massive smile and it just like naturally yeah. brought, made us like smile and we're like, wow, this is <laughs> going to be a cool chat. You know what I mean? <laughs> I, I certainly hope so. I certainly hope so. So you guys doing well today? Yeah, we very well. Yeah, thanks. Well, uh, well. Craig, Craig hasn't had much time today. It's, it's like 4 a.m. for him. So 4 in the morning. <laughs> yeah, so we're ready to, to rock and roll. <laughs> yeah. He had to... He has to do it. the hard yards today. So uh, thanks a lot, That's Craig. Great. <laughs> yeah, it's awesome. No, I love it. Yeah, I'm I, feeling awake. That big smile woke me up and it made me feel super like excited to, to have a good chat to Chris. So I'm ready to rock and roll just, just well, like well, you guys. You're doing the sunrise shift here. <laughs> there you go. Beautiful. <laughs> <I know>. yeah. <laughs> oh, classic. And how's your day been so far, Chris? What have oh, you been up to today? Well, we actually have a, a real summer day going on here. So, uh, you know, we had a, a, an odd and um, unpredictable winter. So now, finally, after a, a sort of prolonged nasty weather, we've got we've got beautiful New England summer. So we're happy, you know, spending time outside working with the plants and things. And it's uh, it's great to finally have the warm days. Uh, that's cool. Yeah. And and Chris, yeah. so, so tell us a bit about where you are. You told us you're in Connecticut River Valley, which is in Massachusetts. So what's it like there? Yeah, we're in the western part of Massachusetts, so about two hours west of Boston by drive. And uh, the whole area is a, a valley around the Connecticut River, which runs north-south here. And there's a lot of agriculture, and there are colleges here, so we have a great kind of stimulating, educated culture. And, um, you know, we live in a really tiny little town, but we're close to a university town, so we don't really miss out on anything at all. And, you know, at night we hear animals instead of cars. <laughs> oh, how nice is that? That's now, weird. you say it's an agricultural 
sort of valley. So I would imagine your own garden is is lush, and uh, and you and do you do a bit of gardening yourself? <laughs> you know, I I garden very little is the truth of the matter because I travel so much. I I oh, mean, yeah. as as much as I advocate, you know, all all forms of good organic production, I have little time to do it mm. myself here. But we do have some beautiful blackberries, and um, you know we're also now allowed to grow our own cannabis in Massachusetts, so we oh, do right. that as well. Yeah, yeah. Ah, cool. Is that something that's like recently become legal, or has it been a while? No, it's been recent. Uh, we've gone from uh, you know completely illegal to medical, and then transitioned to a bill in the state that passed recreational, and everybody's allowed to grow like six plants or so, which is certainly more than enough for a year's supply if you do it right. <laughs> so, so <laughs> perhaps entirely too much, actually. So uh, it you know it's it's a different time. I mean, it used to be quite repressive with cannabis. And now most of the states are finally just sort of falling in line with what's been happening around the world, really. Uh, that's interesting. Wow. How, how has it changed the sort of like mindsets or usage, or, you know, among sort of normal civilians like, <laughs> you know, myself and Craig that are probably not trained on it? Is it changed like... Well, I mean, you know, when my friends and I started out in the 1960s, it was a very furtive event, you know. You didn't just, like, go do it any old place. You have to kind of, you know, skulk off somewhere behind the garage or go up, hey, uh, you want to take a look at my barbecue? Like, oh, yeah, <laughs> you know, slip away out of the party, uh... you know, go behind the garage and, and whatever, and whatever. And of course, now it, it's entirely different from that because of the uh, relaxed laws. So it, it's much more open and, and, you know, there's less paranoia. And it also means that there actually there really is less crime associated because you don't have to be buying. You, know, you don't have to be yeah. buying cannabis from gangsters. Really, you can just grow your own or your pal does or whatever it's a, it's a different an entirely different scene now yeah and with those rules like are you able i know sometimes these rules can be pretty weird like you can have two plants but you can't smoke for example on the streets or you know or you know or something like that it, it, does it have that kind of rule as well yeah, you still can't like sit on the police station steps and blow a joint. That's strict, <laughs> strictly forbidden. They they okay. frown very much on that, actually. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So it's not. You're, you're right. Sorry. It's not. It's not. Uh, well, just as you can't uh, theoretically, you can't drink in public. Uh -huh. You can't, you know, sit in a public park with an open can of beer or something like that. That's not allowed either. So in that sense, it's somewhat similar to what's gone on with alcohol regulation for quite a while. So as long as you put your joint in a brown uh, bag, then you're fine. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like you yeah, would alcohol. <laughs> yeah, but that would be a perfect stoner thing to do to set the bag on fire. Yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> totally. and, and and do you think like most people are using it to just smoke or are a lot of people also using it for other medicinal purposes well i i think that the uh proliferation of knowledge around um you know what the cannabinoids do in our bodies has really advanced its use from a from a genuinely medicinal standpoint um a lot of people turn to, you know, CBD, for example, which is not psychoactive, but is a cannabinoid for pain relief and for, uh, you know, reducing incidence of seizure and for neurological disorders that are not necessarily responsive to uh, anything else. So I, I do think we're seeing a, a tremendous opening in terms of people's awareness of, you know, the, the value of cannabis for pain, for nausea, for glaucoma, for uh, post chemotherapy, you know, helping people to eat um, all the things that we've known about for a long time, plus everything that's coming out about the new cannabinoid research. I mean, this is very exciting time for this plant. And for those of us who've 
been with it one way or another in our lives for 40 and 50 years, uh, it really is a new day with, with what's a, a gigantically popular plant worldwide. Hmm. Hmm. Can, can you Jeez. just explain what a cannabinoid is? Sorry. Well, sure, sure. In cannabis, and I, so I'm talking about you know marijuana, but cannabis is actually the proper name. Um, you have um, you have flowers, buds, and those buds are covered with little tiny hairs that have resin glands at the end of them, and those resin glands are rich in cannabinoids, which are unique compounds to the plant that are uh, active in the nervous system and active in the immune system and uh, enhance uh, cardiac health and um, are, are actually really key to a lot of basic functions in the body. And so um, the cannabinoids, THC, which is what most people know about, gets you high. Uh, and then its companion cannabinoid, uh, CBD, cannabidiol, uh, which is not psychoactive like THC, uh, helps to regulate uh, many of the systems in the body. Again, immune function, inflammation, uh, pain regulation, uh, modifying certain types of gene expression. So, so it, it turns out that the cannabinoids, these compounds in cannabis, uh, are highly valuable to many of the most important life functions that go on in our bodies. Hmm. And Pretty do cool. You, is there is Very there cool. another way of getting cannabinoids only from from that from that specific plant? Well, we actually make a cannabinoid inside our bodies. We make a compound called anandamide. And we do that when we consume uh, good, healthy food uh, through the dietary oils that we take in. We produce a certain amount of this uh, cannabinoid, anandamide. Mm -hmm. And uh, anandamide, interestingly enough, also shows up in chocolate. Uh, uh -huh. the, the darker, the better. Um, but for the most part, there's there's a lot of uh, opinion, or some opinion anyway, that we produce inadequate amounts of this compound for our body's needs. Um, mm. and, and this is we see this with other things as well. I mean, we we see this with vitamins and minerals. You know, mm. um, you know, we have to get them from outside, and and so cannabis is uniquely qualified, if you will, to fit all of these many, many hundreds of receptors throughout our entire bodies uh, that respond to this remarkable plant that whose use goes, you know, way back to antiquity, long, long time ago. Um, you know, I, uh, I'll tell you, cannabis emerged from uh, the last ice age about 12 and a half thousand years ago wow. okay wow and it came and it came out of the central siberian altai region that's where it came out and it headed north and it headed south and you know down through india and asia and all along the silk road and i um i have on various occasions gone to the altai where i've seen millions and millions of tons of cannabis as far as you can see in all directions wow. forever uh, wow. <laughs> and for real for real and and also along the silk road going along the northern trade route right across the northern chinese border from east to west seeing cannabis at you know temples and all along the way um this I actually, in um, my first time in Siberia, I, I, I was riding through the Altai in a van with, with some guys, and, and, and I kept seeing, I, I was pretty sure I was seeing vast fields of cannabis, but I... <laughs> But I couldn't believe it. Okay, I, it, it it didn't totally compute that I was really looking at a sea of cannabis everywhere. And I had them stop, and I got out, and by God, it was just cannabis as far as you could see it. It was fragrant and um, beautifully healthy. And and later, um, 
I was I was staying in a place uh, by myself while my friends went back to their apartments with their families in this particular town. And um, I went to a little grocery store and had a comical exchange with them because I wanted rolling papers and matches. And this is the Siberian Altai, and I speak English, and they speak either Russian or Altai, but clearly not English. So I had to do a whole pantomime about, you have a... And I actually tried the um, the cannabis from that region. I wanted to know, okay, is this psychoactive? I mean, now, you know, many reference books will tell you it is, but I wanted to know for myself, and it certainly was. It wasn't, it wasn't the strongest I'd ever had, but it was unquestionably, uh, you know, real mood modifying cannabis. And so I, I guess a little piece of cred that I have is I've, I've actually gone to the source of where cannabis emerged after the Ice Age and, wow. and tried it and, and investigated it all along its uh, trade route uh, into Asia and Europe. Wow. That's incredible. That what is, is amazing. So you, you talk about being very fragrant, and that made me question, while, well, obviously, while we're discussing cannabis, these days you hear a lot about hydroponics and that kind of thing. Is there a difference between uh, something that, in, uh, is there a difference medicinally, let's say, between something that's grown hydroponically versus something that's just grown naturally like that? Well, for, there's no question that growing plants in soil, uh, those plants that do grow in soil, I mean, you have some plants called epiphytes that just appear on tree branches and, and need no soil or anything. Uh, but, but for sure, you get nutrients in soil uh, in a manner that you you really can't reproduce with mm -hmm. hydroponics. And when soil is living, uh, when it's rich, when it's incredibly fertile, then wow, you know, uh, you, mm -hmm. you can do remarkable things. I mean, I I uh, spend a lot of time in the Amazon rainforest with um, with ayahuasca, uh, you know, the ceremonial psychoactive brew and and. You know, I, I've been around a lot of the vine that's used for that brew and, and seen it, you know, growing wild and, and in different places. And uh, then recently had the opportunity to go see it in Hawaii on the Big mm. Island where people are growing it, you know, removed from the Amazon in soil that is so superior in composition that this stuff just goes berserk. Oh, I mean, wow. You get you have really wonderful, amazing vines in the Amazon, and I and I don't mean to suggest otherwise, but you know Hawaiian vines get bigger, stronger, faster, juicier because the soil is just like you know incredibly powerful soil, and so yeah. while on the one hand I admire the the technical expertise that people bring to hydroponic growing, yeah. we should really be emphasizing fertile soil. That's, that's yeah. my opinion. Yeah, for wow. sure. And, and just so you, you know, those like fields and stuff that you said you saw in Russia, like, like, what do they use it all for? Like, I mean, you don't really associate say Russians as being stoneheads generally, do you? Like, I mean, well, are well, they using well, it for medicine? No, this is the amazing thing. All along the Silk Road, you know, especially like through Xinjiang, which is a vast, vast, vast region of China, and, and in the Altai, they don't use it. They really <laughs> don't. So they have millions of tons of nutritious seed going to waste. They have incalculable millions of tons of fiber going to waste. Yeah. Uh, certainly an enormous, enormous amount of... Uh, psychoactive cannabis going to waste. And I have read some very brief, sketchy mentions of uh, people in the Altai making hash. I, I certainly didn't run into it, which doesn't mean anything at all. It just means I didn't run into it. But yeah. uh, it, it doesn't seem to be an overly big thing there, despite the super abundance. It's, it's like dandelions. I mean, you know, wow. Yeah, yeah, it's it's outrageous. <laughs> <laughs> Jeez. I mean, 
you can't even imagine that kind of a forest of marijuana. Right, just right, like right. But yeah, I mean, like but... you say, you mentioned some of the other uh, benefits or, or let's say um, uses of cannabis and fiber being one of them for clothing, for I've heard it being used for like even building in certain indust- uh-huh. uh, industries. Uh, tell us a bit more about some of the other uses that for, and you said seeds as well, nutritious well, seeds. So. Yeah, when when you go into uh, like the Himalayan hill region of India, you you'll go into markets, you know, where they'll sell grains and beans and spices and things, and invariably they'll have huge sacks of cannabis seeds. And you buy a kilo of those and you go home and when you make your vegetable curry, you grind up a lot of these seeds, which are super rich in in nutritious uh, vegetable-based omega-3 fatty acids. And you get this tremendous concentration of protein as well from Mm. them. And they mix well with other foods. You know, you grind them up like an immortal and mortar and pestle and, and then boom, you've got this walloping load of nutrition, dirt, dirt, cheap. So, mm. uh, you know, and we see like in, in natural food stores here, for example, you know, you get hemp oil for as, as a, as a, like a salad oil, uh, or, and, you know, and as a nutritious supplementary oil and, and it's very, very good. It's tasty. Um, you know, this is a super versatile plant and, and I'm mm. pretty sure that we're going to, at some point, declare it the most versatile medicine on earth. Wow! Wow! That's fascinating. That's so, incredible. So, when you say hemp oil, are you saying are you telling us that hemp seeds are the seeds of cannabis? Is that yes, a, yes, wow. yeah. I mean, c- cannabis. Look, hemp. The difference between hemp and and psychoactive cannabis is that hemp is that grows with almost no THC at all. So you could smoke a truckload of this stuff and you would not get high from it. You'd just regret the experience, you know. <laughs> so, so, but in that instance, in the case of industrial hemp, which is very, very tall, it's actually the stock of the plant that's crushed mm-hmm. and is used to make oil uh, that we see high CBD oil for inflammation, for pain, for uh, kids with seizures, that kind of thing. And... Um, but then any and all cannabis, uh, that has seeds, you can crush those seeds and get a nutritious oil. That's very good as just a a regular vegetable oil. Uh, and it also is a good source of, of vegetable omega-3 fatty acids. (laughs) Yeah. And the seeds don't contain any THC then? Uh, No, such microscopic amounts that you, you can not possibly get an effect no 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 all right so let's here's the question where is the strongest psychoactive marijuana that you've had (laughs) and where was (laughs) well uh, you know strong is a funny term i mean Mm. um i I really liked what i have encountered uh, in the himalayan hill regions um you know and i think a lot of that owes to the setting and that kind of Mm. you know makes a point about in my work traveling around the world and investigating medicinal plants you know when i drink kava i drink kava in vanuatu south pacific with native guys who are like you know hundreds of generations deep in terms of kava drinking uh in the uh, himalayan hill region smoking their local hashish at a temple with a priest while they're playing holy music and there's a little fire oh. going it's it the entire thing it's not just the cannabis itself you know um being with my wife zoe in the amazon rainforest drinking ayahuasca there with shamans that we know who are profoundly talented you know that that is that whole experience is is the thing so uh, in some respects i don't isolate uh let's say the particular strain of cannabis although i will say that i encountered a strain in um amsterdam many years ago (laughs) a, a strain in a in a cafe uh they called it kali mist and um uh-huh. I, it it 
it frightened the crap out of me, actually. <laughs> it, was, it was so horrendously strong that I was clutching myself. It was very, <laughs> it was way too, too intense. I, you know, I Mildly don't, paranoid. <laughs> oh, don't actually need that at all, you know? So yeah. that was funny. Sure. That was funny. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> but, but I think the, I think the idea for me is that getting to the source of something, you know, uh, mm. like, having ginseng where it's grown in northeastern China by the, mm. you know, what used to be Manchuria, um, that's, it's just going to be better than the same mm. ginseng here, you know, because it's the entire experience of the place and the people and the day and the moment and the, you know, whatever, digging it out of the ground with my own mm. knife or, or however it is. It, it, you know, this is, this is, uh, this is, if no pun intended, really the roots of uh, plant medicine, you know, uh, going to the sources of coffee all over the world and cocoa and, and, and so many different crops, you know, saffron and um, medicinal plants worldwide. It, 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 it's definitely valuable to, to employ them, to use them here. You know, we can benefit from those for sure, but there's nothing like uh, consuming them in their home in their hometown, so to speak. Yeah, 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 yeah that makes sure. so much sense. Hey, Chris, um, wow. just to kind of uh, give this chat like a little bit of context, uh, <laughs> I, I, I actually I sort of came aware of you through through a friend of mine, um, Lana. Uh, you were on her podcast um, a while back, and. Um, you know, we, we basically got in contact because we both did this uh, same course together okay. and um, we're on, you know, we're on a podcast call uh, probably a few months ago and I, and I saw her stuff and I was like, oh my word, um, I saw your one. I was like, we have to, um, you know, get you on our podcast. And uh, she's like, yeah, no worries. Um, let me email and see if I can set it up for you. And then yeah. I know you've been gallivanting all around the world. So um you know, thanks very much. Like yeah, last week, it was like, or like a couple of weeks ago, Zoe was like, yeah, cool. You're back in town. Let's do this. So, um, <laughs> so yeah, so that's how, that's how kind of we, we know you and we know of you. And also, I, I yeah. appreciate Lorna. I, I like what she does. You yeah. know, I was happy to be on her podcast. Yeah. 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 That's cool, man. Um, so yeah, what we, I mean, you've lived an amazingly colorful life that's for sure you know based on like the sort of research that we've been doing on you beforehand and we just honestly there's so much stuff we want to talk about because it seriously mm. is fascinating um and but but if you can just you know take us back to the start you know like uh, we know you were born uh, back in the 50s in uh, boston and you had a very uh, colorful childhood as well you know and uh, yeah let's just sort of start there and then um, head off from there well, uh, I'll make the I'll make the Boston part of it quick. I mean, yeah. I actually was was born in the city of Boston, and I and I feel proud of that. I I like Boston as a city. It, it, I have great affection for it, even though I don't choose to live there. But um, my mother and father were both in the uh, broadcasting, advertising, PR kind of scene, and my mom was on air talent, so she was radio and TV. And I, I'm pretty sure she was the first on-air pitch woman on, in Boston TV. She was certainly one of the first. And, um, and, and so I would go with her to the radio stations where she would do commercials. And then I would go with her to the TV stations where she would do commercials live, <laughs> live wow. commercials. Yeah, because wow. what, what happened was back in the, in the late 50s, the national brands, you know, if you were a big national brand, you know, whatever, Ford Motor Cars or something like that, then then you would have a recorded commercial. But then in all of the other markets, you see, it, at that point in time, it was live commercials. So, you know, this this program brought to you by Frigidaire. Wow. And then, you know, somebody <laughs> would be showing off a refrigerator, right? So my mom... My mom did all different kinds of commercials and I'd go in and hang out and it was fascinating for me. And sometimes the engineers would go, hey, you see that dial over there? And, be like, yeah. and they go, turn it to four. And I'd be like, what? <laughs> okay. <laughs> you know? 
And and, uh, and at one point when I was around seven, my mom said, do you want to do a commercial? And I said, yeah, sure. What do I have to do? And she said, you have to drink grape juice. You have to say it's good and you have to ask for more. And I went, really? I'm like, OK, you know, how hard can this be? So uh, so we did that and that was great fun. That's and good. it was just a live local commercial. So, you know, there's no like recording someplace out there, you know, in the archives of something is just, you know, lost to the sands of time. <laughs> what a pity. That, that was um, that was the earliest beginning of doing, uh, you know, a lifetime of TV and radio, my own programs. Uh, I finished up about a year ago. I finished up 10 years on Fox News Health around the world. Um, mm. but Fox mm. News is an unlikely political partner for sure, but, uh, <laughs> but I was on in 100 countries, so it was great for me. Wow. Um, but but um, I, I think, uh, you know, my dad was uh, diabetic, and so at an early age, I became aware that food had a direct relationship to health. At a time when most doctors were denying that, his entire staying alive was based on that concept, you know. Yeah. So, uh, so anyway, I, I think that was a strong influence in terms of making me aware of, of what stuff was a good idea to eat and what wasn't, you know. And, and we ate relatively clean and all of that. And um, then, you know, the 60s hit like uh, an atom bomb and all of a sudden. <laughs> You know, at age 15, uh, I got high for the very first time. And, and my choice was 250 micrograms of pure LSD. Whoa. So that was my introduction to Whoa. altered states of consciousness. And, um, <laughs> and it, was, it was a profoundly amazing day. You know, really uh, just outrageous in every conceivable fall day at boarding school i was at a preparatory boarding school and um a saturday and it was absolutely hilarious and and the same <laughs> the same thing was happening to my friends you know in other places and and so that then encouraged many of us to inquire into yoga and meditation and start reading you know things like the tibetan book of the dead and you know all these have all these obscure books all of a sudden became vastly popular because we were doing acid going, wow, man, you know, like the Tibetans had this stuff figured out 2000 <laughs> years ago. Let's check this out. And, uh, and, and so being part of that time, which was also a time when people were suddenly, you know, becoming aware of natural foods and organics and and liberal politics. And it was just this massive cultural explosion. And I was really fortunate to be dead center in that generationally. And, um, you know, so I started I was the one among my friends who learned to cook brown rice <laughs> because, <laughs> you know, nobody knew how to do it. Right. You know, it was hard. Yeah. The stuff that, it was not like Uncle Ben's converted rice. Yeah. You know, this is difficult. <laughs> and um, then I started, uh, we lived about a half hour away from Boston when or, where I was growing up. So I would started going into Boston to Chinatown and I would go into these Chinese apothecary stores, all these herbs, you know, and I knew nothing. <laughs> I had no idea what I was looking at, except I knew about ginseng. So I would buy a ginseng root so they wouldn't throw me out because I'd spend <laughs> I'd spend all this time like, looking at stuff and reading labels. You know, what, what, what is it? Yeah, what yeah. is it? <laughs> Smelling thing. <laughs> then, and then there was a... Um, in the same area of town, there was a theater. It was a, a porno theater at night, but during the day they played really cheesy kung fu movies, and <laughs> and everybody in there but me was like an older Chinese guy, and so they're like <laughs> spitting on the floor and smoking <laughs> cigarettes and <clears throat> eating really really stinky food, and and of course all the the kung fu movies were in you know, Mandarin or whatever. So, you know, but you always knew after about five minutes who was the hero 
who was the bad <laughs> guy, who was the love interest, and how it was going to sort out. So that was kind of the beginning of my interest in things natural and also in, in medicinal plants. Yeah. Wow. It's such a, it was an interesting time as well. Like that was, you know, after the Cold War sort of things were happening, I guess your childhood, that must have influenced things as well. There was a lot on the on the map then and the political climate must have been quite interesting. And then you're finding these this whole other world that was out there, you know, reading those kind of books. And, and I guess that took you away from that kind of strange political time in, in America and around the world. So oh, did that have no. an influence as well? No, there was no getting away from the war in Vietnam. And, you know, I mean, we were we were drenched in politics is Mm -hmm. the truth of the matter. But we found something we 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 realized that there were whole other avenues of thought and experience that either were deliberately kept from us or that people were too lame to know existed. But either way, we wanted in, you know. <laughs> it's like, oh, well, well, like yoga, shamanism, really? Yeah. How cool is that? You know, uh, I mean, we ate it up. We ate it up as much as we could, you know. We, we got initiated into meditation. We took yoga classes. We read all the books, you know. Like uh, my friends and I are pretty much devoured whatever the spiritual output was at that time, uh, while at the very same time, you know, we were concerned about being drafted and being shot dead mm. in Southeast Asia. Wow. And and Just, how did that yeah. also fit in, I guess, with your sort of family values of your of your folks? Because your dad was, a, he was a reverend, am I right? And I think your uncles were um, ministers as well? Well, actually, my grandfather on my mother's side was a uh, minister, and then my mother's brother uh, was. My dad was in uh, the the non-talent side of broadcasting, so more like in the wow. advertising, sales, and production, and that kind of thing. But um, <laughs> so, wait, what was the question? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. I I just thought that uh, that your dad was like a you know um, sort of religious and and your uncle and stuff, but it was you actually your granddad. So, but how? Yeah, I mean, and, yeah. Was he was he around when you were doing all of this stuff? Oh, oh, yeah. And, and the thing was that he was a he was a great man. I mean, he was a, he was very ecumenical. You know, as he liked to say, everybody in his church had a different religion. I mean, he had. Mm-hmm you know, as many books on Buddhism and Hinduism and, you know, all of the religions and philosophies of the world as he did on Christianity. He was, he was a real scholar and, and he was very supportive of my pursuits. You know, he really championed what I was doing. And, um, you know, when other people in the family thought that maybe I was just wigging a little too far out past the shipping lanes, you know, he was a, he was really a staunch defendant. He understood that, um, spiritual pursuit and inquiry can happen in a lot of ways. So I, I think what I got from him and from my uh, grandmother was this great sense of service. You know, I like I like to engage in work that that has some sort of a, a beneficial purpose for people and the environment, and then figure out how that's also profitable and sustainable that way. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And what was music playing a role uh, as you'd imagine it was at that time? It was an interesting time for for that side of one's uh, well-being. Well, I, I have to say that at least in my life, um, among the people that I know, there was never a time that we saw experienced as rich, not only as rich an explosion of music, but also such a radical diversion and departure from the music that had come before. I mean, yes, you can trace roots and all of that, and you can go back to Delta Blues and, you know, blah, 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 and, you know, before Chuck Berry, you know, fine. But the fact of the matter is, you know, like the the things like the San Francisco sound, I mean, it it was actually mind-blowing. And then the whole British invasion came. You know, these guys who like they didn't have to worry about the draft. So they'd been sitting on, in a bedroom upstairs in their mom's house for like a decade and a half, becoming <laughs> guitar geniuses and gods, yeah. you know, and showing up fronting bands like Zeppelin. And we were going, yeah. 
who oh the hell God. are these people? <laughs> and then Jimmy wow. came. And then Jimmy came along, and all the guitarists just seriously considered giving up the instrument and yeah. never touching it again. Uh, <laughs> you know? <is> true? <laughs> so yeah, the music, the music, and the music was intensely political, yeah. and and very spiritual, and and a lot mm. of it acid driven, and it was outrageous. It was outrageous. It, it it was with us every single day, and Dylan and Donovan and the Doors yes. and the Kinks yeah. and the Stones <laughs> and the Beatles and you know the oh. Dave Clark Five and I mean these these were monster monster things yeah. that happened at that time at that time at an at an inter- influential age as a as a sort of t uh, you know your formative years how lucky uh, you guys were to to have that explosion at that time I reckon wow. <laughs> Yeah, it, it was part of the uh, the full blowing open of the stifled 1950s. I mean, basically, we left the 50s in smoldering ruins in the middle of the street. And, uh, <laughs> you know, <laughs> we really did. We really yeah. did. Yeah. And, yeah. and so, so, like, you know, you're known like, as the sort of uh, Indiana Jones of uh, natural medicine and, and clearly... You know, in your teenagehood, you took a keen interest in in these um, sort of uh, things. So, but, but like, what is the sort of trajectory from there? Like, like, did you go and study um, plants, or did you go? Were you going to travel in places and find out more? How did it sort of take off from when you were a teenager? Well, well, amazingly enough, I was not aware that there were people, even people relatively close at hand, like in Cambridge, Massachusetts, who knew everything that I wanted to know about. Uh, I I literally didn't know it. And so my trajectory was uh, very unplanned, non-linear, probably more difficult than it had to be. I I got involved with, you know, like natural products, uh, you know, co-ops and natural food stores and all that really early in my uh, late teens and, you know, read every book I could and anybody I met who knew something about herbs, I I learned what I could from them with the time that I had. And uh, it was a long process. And and I became aware quite early that I loved travel. So I had an unformed idea backed up by absolutely nothing that I, I really w- I wanted to be paid to go around the world investigating medicinal plants. And um, there was no, certainly no apparent path to that outcome. <laughs> uh, so, so, you know, I, I, I did a lot of work in the natural products industry and very fortunately uh, distinguished myself uh, through marketing and through my dedication to organics and becoming uh, knowledgeable about herbs over time, and really, um, you know, and, and and did travel and did investigate herbs when I did. But really, I've been doing this uh, as a career since um, only really since 1994. Uh, you know. But but now what I do is I, I do exactly what I had hoped to do all that time. Yeah. Uh, I travel around the world on behalf of different companies. Sometimes I fund my own projects if I just feel like it. But um, on behalf of companies who over time, you know, I've been able to investigate plants in, in well over 40 countries So in Asia and South America and, and, um, you know, the Pacific islands and, and, you know, just all over Africa, it's been quite remarkable. And, and the, um, you know, I, I, I work on the chain of trade, if you will. So, so how do you, how do you get this particular route, let's say from Namibia to, France or to the U.S. or whatever in a manner that doesn't wipe it out, Mm. that provides a better living for the people who are doing the backbreaking labor of digging this out of the ground in the sweltering hot sun while there are lions prowling around, (laughs) Uh, you know, no, for real, for real, you know, it's incredibly hazardous what people are doing out there all Mm. the time. You know, harvesting stuff in places where you've got completely lethal snakes everywhere and, 
you know, it, it's, I mean, the, like guys go into the rainforest to, uh, in Malaysia to harvest Tonkin Ali, which is a, a sex enhancing root from a tree. Okay. And it's backbreaking labor and incredibly difficult to bring out of that forest because the forest is all these super slippery, steep, very, very steep, rocky, slidey hills all over the place. Mm. There are like 27 kinds of poisonous snakes. You know, Jeez. six of them Jeez. are totally deadly if they bite you, and a couple are, <laughs> are and a couple are aggressive. So it's like you're screwed. Oh. And you know this is this is uh, what I'm what I'm making a point about is that it isn't just some kind of idyllic scene out there in terms of you know people enjoying good happy lives in the sun swinging baskets of flowers as they pick <laughs> pick our herbs you know it's it's actually millions and millions of people doing really backbreaking labor all over the place and the idea is to help improve their circumstance and to help maintain the environment in better shape longer through thoughtful, well-figured-out trade that then gets you guys, let's say, uh, the pain-relieving anti-arthritic mm. you need or the digestive you want or the, you know, the mind-sharpening herb that, that enhances cognitive accuracy, I mean, all of that stuff. Wow. Wow, so, so there's so much to to explore there. Now go ahead, guys. No, yeah, no. I was just going to ask. So, like, how do you make it sort of sustainable, safer, and maybe more accessible to you know to these people that are farming it and and to people that need it? Well, um, I I like to say that that I'm really about being helpful to some people for a period of time. I mean, I have no illusions that these things endure because they don't really. It's an ever shifting landscape. But basically, um, you know, the, in a chain of trade, often you have uh, middle people who may or may not be necessary to the equation. And if those middle people who usually double the price of something that they take in, if they can be replaced by the people who are doing the work in the field, mm -hmm. then they can make twice what they would typically make. Yeah. So that's a kind of a modification that helps an awful lot of people um, very rapidly and teaches them new skills. Yeah. And then on, on my side, if I do TV, for example, and I talk about a particular route that is good for, you know, whatever I'm talking about, uh, endurance or stamina, sports performance, let's say, within the case of ashwagandha from India, um, then I am the person or one of the people helping to give those folks in the field access to the market, okay? You know, basically being an advocate on their behalf um, helps to accomplish something that they may not be in a position to accomplish themselves. You know, they don't have the money or the contacts or the whatever. And, and, you know, I, I do, I yeah. do. So I can help to make that happen. And then the net result is people get good health products, uh, which maybe steers them away from toxic or even completely lethal pharmaceuticals. Mm. And, um, people all along the chain and the environment fare better. That's the plan. And it goes, you know, it goes better in some circumstances than in others, for sure. I, I don't want to suggest that it's easy, and it's certainly not uniform. Sometimes it's very hard to do this stuff. But, but you know, that's what it's about, is going to the field and, and making these projects work. Yeah. Oh, it's such important work as well, like, you know, that you are creating – a greater good on the, on the whole people are, have access but you're still trying to support you know the actual people doing the break ba breaking back breaking work and i guess it is a real tough one to try and because money gets involved and then it gets obviously more complicated and um can't be an easy task but i just wanted to take a, a small step back to your indiana jones sort of side of you the w when you uh, it's it's still linking to what we're talking about but when you originally sort of got interested in the the travel and the and the experimentation side of things, did you 
have this idea of what what was your like driving force? You wanted to know more about people. You wanted to, or had you heard that a route, for example, did something and you wanted to go and try it to see for yourself? Or was it the combination? Or how, like what was the driving force in the early days in terms of, and how did you go about it? Did you sit with people and ask them what were the, the, the plants being used? And what was that process specifically like? Well, actually, there were two events that I can say really boosted everything I've done. Um, in 1979, at a dinner party, a friend of mine, I was with all herbalists, okay, you know, so we had all kinds of extracts and different things. And you know, we, you know, this is just what we did. And, and, and these guys actually made herbal products. And so a friend pulled out a little jar of goo, this black goo, stuck a chopstick into it so he got a bit of goo about the size of a garbanzo bean he said try this i i put it in my mouth and it numbed my tongue and pretty quick pretty quickly i felt pleasantly high and i said you know what the hell is this and he said it's kava and i said really is this stuff legal and he said yes it is and so that oddly enough uh in 1995 became the plant that because of that connection way back then, I wound up advocating. And, and frankly, the plant that made me uh, well known to the extent that I am, it, it, it broke humongous uh, media for me in Wall Street Journal and USA Today and ABC 2020 and all the major networks all at once. And, 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 so, and, and so that was an enormous very rapid boost for me. Uh, my my interests were always to go to remote exotic places. I had watched a travelogue show when I was a kid, this guy named Cowboy Joe Woods, uh, who I subsequently met like 30 years later. But uh, Cowboy Joe Woods was the first travelogue ever on TV. He was the first person with the pygmies on TV. He went to remote places and... You know, I would sit and walk. I, I want to go there. <laughs> like, I, I want to go there. Like for sure, I want to go there. And um, and so part of the drive was a longing to get out and see the world, and and also, uh, you know, I like the whole idea of linking it to something of genuine worth and value. And I was absolutely convinced that that herbs, medicinal plants. Um, you know, were, were critically important. I mean, obviously they are They're the most widely used medicines on earth, but, but, um, so, so I would say that the driving forces were, were, um, you know, many, and also, um, I really like very much being challenged. Uh, you know, um, I was, I was approached by a well-financed group with whom I did the Kava and, um, you know, I proposed a whole way of working in the field that I had never actually done before that way. <laughs> and and I was totally confident that I would, in fact, succeed. And I succeeded beyond my expectations. But yeah. I, I like I like uh, I've been in many, many situations in the field where I encounter things that I've never encountered before or the setup, and I have to figure it out, and that becomes a really fascinating and um, kind of concentrating driving factor. You know, that mm. I mentioned that there were two two incidents. The second one was around um, 1983, I think. A woman I know in the herbal business in Utah. I was talking with her on the phone. You know, we connect. We all we all talk with each other. We read each other's articles. We buy the same books. You know, we we were dipping into the same pool of journal articles as they come out. And this woman said, "You know, you really ought to get get familiar with maca. Maca is uh, something I think you ought to know about." And I and I said oh, I thanked her and I went looking around for information on maca and found very, very little at all, but, but a bit, a bit. And subsequently, uh, in, um, I was 93, I guess. And then in 98, I wound up going to the Peruvian Andes 
and working with maca, which is a basically an Andean superfood, and uh, that initiated a twenty year project that continues to this day and that has resulted in oh uh, hmm, thousands of tons of shipped maca. Uh, it has really enhanced the lives of many of the people up there who live pretty much like they're on the surface of the moon. Mm. And, and, you know, all along the way, also what it means is, by the way, you know, this isn't, I'm, I'm not Mahatma Gandhi. Okay. I mean, I'm driven, <laughs> by, I'm driven by self-interest. I love being out there. I mean, I love traveling with my wife, Zoe, and going to great places, and we've done a lot of that, but I also do a lot of what are called, you know, I like to call guy trips. You know, I'm going to be with a bunch of guys in a truck in Congo. I'm, I'm you know, going, doing wow. this thing, and um, the point is, it's a gas out there. <laughs> it's blast doing this stuff. <laughs> I mean, you know, when I when I was working with Kava in Vanuatu, South Pacific, you know, Kava is a tranquility promoting plant uh, that meant complete immersion into South Pacific culture and becoming, a, you know, an honorary chief there and eventually their diplomat to the U.S. and, uh, <laughs> you know, and, and then firewalking and and. Firewalking was completely unexpected. Uh, a, a, a village that we were very close to, my my friend Paya and I, he was a Tahitian prince. The, the story gets <laughs> more diverse. Um, you know, this village got wiped out by a tsunami. No. And, uh, and, and everybody in the village but four elderly people were up on a hill at a marriage. It was just an amazing occurrence wow. that they were safe but the entire village got sucked out to sea so they were left Goodness. homeless and penniless so my friend Paya who was a, a trained Tahitian firewalker what they call a Tahua uh, he was from Tahiti which is Polynesia and Vanuatu is Melanesia so the people look much more kind of like classically African sort of Negroid um, and, and he said, well, you know, let's let's have a fire walk and we'll raise a whole ton of money and we'll help to rebuild Bay Martelli. And, you know, this is like a great idea. Wow. What a phenomenal idea. So <laughs> but, but but the implication, of course, when I finally was there, you know, because this is like these things take weeks to put together. <laughs> the building of this massive, massive, massive fire pit, like a dozen guys working all day long and, you know, splitting, oh. splitting up like 12 mature sea pines and bringing in 40 or 50, 50 tons of humongous river stones and, wow. you know, women preparing tons of food, actual tons and yes. like kill, killing of oxen and pigs and, you know, getting a, two tons of taro root in there and all this stuff. And, and the, the, the point is that at some point I discovered to my chagrin that I had to come to terms with the fact of actually, actually <laughs> wa walking <laughs> on fire. <laughs> which, oh my God. Which, which as it turns out is completely and absolutely terrifying. And, <laughs> you know, people talk, I mean, you know, this whole Indiana Jones thing, I mean, the truth of the matter is I would love to be the medicine hunter, okay? <laughs> you know? But the idea sounds like so much more daring than I really am. I mean, I, I do this stuff. I actually do this stuff, you know? I, I do it, but um, I, I'm not, you know, like the brave, powerful warrior just marching fearlessly into the fire. I'm like, I'm going to stand in the back of the line of all these native guys. And if absolutely not one of them dies in the fire, <laughs> then I'll go. But other, so, so, so the, to make a, an incredibly long story, very short, the, <laughs> the very first time at the fire, a thousand people showed up. What? Wow. And we charged them $3 a piece to be there and also to have the feast afterwards. That's the tons of food, wow. the eight pigs and the oxen and the, you know, all of that. And, um, and the hundreds of gallons of kava. And, um, so anyway, 
my friend Paya is at the edge of the fire, and he's doing this. Oh, first, we, six of us had to take great big, huge bamboo poles and stand and beat the stones that are on top of the fire that are glowing red hot so that people wouldn't fall into fire holes when they walked, right? <laughs> so we're out there beating those stones, and I'm thinking, this is nothing but a bad idea. This is just like a total disaster. What have I gotten myself into? I don't have to do this. I've got nothing to prove. I'm already <laughs> bargaining with myself. So we get done with that, and then the Paya gets at the edge of the fire, and his right-hand guy, Kami, gets behind him. And I go to the back of the line. Wow. All my friends, I'm like behind 24 native guys. I'm like, I am going to play this so safe. And I'm still yeah. thinking, I may not walk across this. <laughs> but, but, I, but here's the problem. I'm an honored guest, okay? Uh -huh. So Kami comes running up to me, and he goes, no, man. You don't go at the back of the line. Oh, wow. Up front. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> uh, classic. So, so all of a sudden, it's Paya and Kami wow. and me and two oh, dozen my. native guys behind me. And I'm thinking, this is just completely awful. I want oh, nothing to do with this. And it's like, <laughs> so Super hot. hot. You know, you can flash fry steaks on these stones, and oh, I'm just going, God. I don't want this. And then Paya went <laughs> just walking out into the fire, which is completely lunatic, and he didn't die, and, and okay. And then Kami walked, and I got two dozen guys behind me, and <laughs> this is not Once good. Once you go, you go. Jeez. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I so that was the the first um, of many times of five times on the fire that night and um, doing that over uh, six different uh, six different years doing this to uh, raise funds for different charities you know so so it's not just you go to investigate a plant you hang out you talk about the plant you look at it you pick it you smell it you taste it you leave it's, it's you have to get well i have to get very deeply involved with these people you yeah. know um that's my aim is well, well how far can you go how far can we go here yeah. like what's the closest we can get What's the most fun we can have? What's the best project we can do? You know, like, let's make this as great a time as possible. Mm. And, and so, so talk a bit more about the actual walk. Like, you know, what is it like? And how do you not burn your feet? Um, the very first time I did burn my right foot, actually <laughs> fairly badly. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but I don't know how it works. Uh, you have to walk slowly and carefully because the stones are uneven, uneven and there are fire holes between them and the pit's like 35 feet long and you have to take your time and it's dark outside. It's nighttime. And um, I don't know how it works. Honestly, I truly do not know. I've never been anything other than completely scared. And, um, you know, and after the first firewalk, then I was one, <laughs> ironically, one of the leaders of the firewalk. So I would have this special leaf robe made for me that day, and we would be completely covered in oil. And I never got a satisfactory explanation about why we were covered in oil. But we were, I mean, when I say we were covered, I mean, from head to toe, just like every last little bit of us, just like completely slathered in coconut oil and tomato <laughs> oil. and then this leaf robe completely covered with that as well and you know okay fine and wow. then, <laughs> then we would go and lead these fire walks <laughs> wow. and i i think the thing about it was which is also true with other things that i did with my friend paya uh these were epic times these were times when we managed with just a lot of incredible good fortune to boost the national economy of this little country by like 8%. Wow. That's wow. humongous. Yeah. Millions and millions of extra dollars in trade and kava. Um, and, you know, and I'm not suggesting that all of it went off beautifully and smoothly. That's yeah. never true. Not when money's involved. 
but but it did revolutionize what happened down there. And so, you know, it's a matter of having having a purpose, figuring out how you want it to go, working on making that structure, putting that structure together and having as good a time as possible in the process. Yeah. And and so is this can you just tell us a little bit more about uh, Carver and um what kind of happens to the supplies? Like, it's not like Vanuatu is a massive place. So, well, does it grow like wildfire? Or, well, kava is um, a a bush in the pepper family, and the root of it, uh, which is quite large, is chopped up, and ground up, and mixed with water and made into a drink that is non-alcoholic and it's non-cooked. And when you drink kava, when you drink it fresh, as they do in Vanuatu, South Pacific, you get an immediate relaxing effect. Mm. Uh, so right away, you feel this ah, this kind of greater sense of ease. And it is very much a, um, a tranquility-promoting agent. Uh, it's not pleasant tasting at all. Nobody goes, gosh, that's delicious kava. Nobody's <laughs> ever said that. In history, but um, <laughs> but it's there. It's fast acting, and and, and in the afternoon in Vanuatu, uh, you know, it, they have what they call kava time, and somebody will say, "Hey man, what time it is? You know, what time is it?" And then everybody will go, "It's kava time." Oh. <laughs> they'll just they'll stop whatever they're doing, and then this whole making of kava is a very labor intensive process. So they really they have to really work on this very tough, tough, fibrous route. But in Vanuatu, whose entire national population is like 250,000 people, um, the, uh, there are millions and millions of kava bushes. So yeah, the supply is pretty good, and kava grows in other um, South Pacific places as well, Tonga, Samoa, Fiji, uh, you know, some in Tahiti, New Caledonia. So, so it, it's around, it's around, but it, but the effect is very lovely. And you, we'd sit together. Nobody goes off and drinks kava by themselves. You, you hang out with people, you drink, you talk about your day and say, Hey, I, I saw you out. You were fishing out by Pongi point, weren't you? And you go, yeah, yeah, man. You know, I, I got some tuna and I go, Oh, that's great. You know, we, we share. It's yeah. basically all about kinship and then we go off and we have dinner at home and we do what we do but it's it's a lovely plant and for our purposes in modern society it's very good for relieving anxiety it's very good for uh relieving stress it's good for helping people to sleep so um you know with a lot of these medicinal plants there's the traditional use i, I really only Frankly, I really only use kava now if I'm in the South Pacific drinking kava. Uh, mm -hmm. Otherwise, I don't particularly use it at home. Um, but it has been translated into something that you can take in a concentrated supplement form for anxiety, for tranquility, for better sleep. So it has made that translation through technology as well as it's made a translation from you know native culture to modern society are there other medicinal uses for it in terms of some kind of a healing thing and, and also how do uh, how do people generally use it nowadays in the west do they also not i mean obviously you say you can get it in like a concentrated form is it like a tablet or do you still drink it well, actually, there are kava bars that have sprung up uh, in the U.S., so Florida, New York. I have a friend who has a kava bar in Hawaii, and there are kava bars on the West Coast. So some people are actually drinking kava kind of like they do in the islands, you know, and, mm -hmm. and making an event of it. Uh, but there are a lot of kava supplements, uh, concentrated liquids, um, some in capsules, that kind of thing. In fact, uh, after about a year and a half of working on popularizing kava back in the 90s, I brought, um, oh, 20, 30 different samples of kava products that had come out in the market. I brought them back to Vanuatu <laughs> and I gave a presentation 
to a bunch of native guys who were brought in from the bush. So we did it in this great big kind of like a longhouse place. And I showed them all these liquids and these powders and these capsules and they were completely blown away they you know the, <laughs> what one product even had a photograph of a local guy who i'd asked if it was okay if i used his photo <laughs> holding a bunch of kava roots and they just couldn't get over that and um I turned my back on like all of these products for just a few minutes talking with somebody. And when I turned around, every last product was gone, you know, <laughs> so gone back to native huts someplace deep in the bush, you know, where when, when you go in way out in the countryside, you'll see a lantern at night in, in the forest. And you know that the lantern means there's kava there. So you go, you follow a little path to that lantern <laughs> cool. and you'll get a, a coconut shell of kava and, and you'll drink that or you'll sit around. Maybe you'll have several. But um, but I would say that a lot of people in um, in non island communities are using capsules and, and concentrated mm. extracts. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Interesting. And how does that make you feel? Or, or was it something you were involved in is like sort of conver converting it from its natural form into, you know, like capsules or uh, whatever other forms there are? Well, actually, I, I'm one of the people who has been key to that, uh, you know, really uh, pushing diverse forms of preparation uh, in the market. Uh, I've done hundreds and hundreds of presentations on kava. I don't do so many anymore, but I used to do lots and lots of them. And, and, and my objective with these plants is finding ways, uh, forms, as long as they remain effective. That's key. Mm. Finding forms that will satisfy the needs of people uh, in this society. I mean, you know, I, I got news. Most people are not going to tolerate drinking kava the way they drink it in Vanuatu because the taste is just too, too difficult. Yeah. And, and so, which, which is actually, of course, a limiting factor with ayahuasca as well from the Amazon rainforest. I mean, people are drinking it for sure. They're drinking it in ceremonies around the world, but, um, you know, ayahuasca is you, you could you could absolutely make the the claim that ayahuasca is vile tasting and not be too, you know, too extreme in your description. Uh, you know, the the flavors, these forms are just not suitable for, say, the broader palate. Yeah, mm. yeah, for sure. So, and just briefly, do do the locals um, there that, that drink, say, kava regularly do they also find it vile or have they kind of accus become accustomed to it and think, oh, this is pretty good kava? <laughs> you know, as, as one lifetime kava drinker said to me, he said, sometimes I just don't want to drink it. It's just too <laughs> awful. Uh, wow. I mean, the, the, you know, a lot of my native friends in Vanuatu are, they're they're big kava drinkers. They'll drink ten or twelve shells of kava in a night. I've never had more than five, oh. and I usually stop at two. Um, oh. But they're serious. They're like the dreadlock rastas of kava. You know, they're no <laughs> joke. Um, oh. And so, uh, I, I mean, they they clearly get used to it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, but that's that's the thing is that we 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 make great accommodations for many of the psychoactive agents. You know, they may make us throw mm -hmm. up or they may taste nasty or whatever, but we want that effect and we're willing to put up with whatever the barrier is. Yeah, for sure. Mm -hmm. And so you, you touched on ayahuasca now, but before we actually go there, because it's fascinating, um, you mentioned mocha and uh I'm like thinking, oh, you mean like coffee and on choc and hot chocolates, <laughs> but obviously it's um it's it's something else. What what is mocha? Oh, okay, okay. You're referring to a mocha. Mocha. So yeah. exactly <laughs> that, that the combination of of coffee and chocolate, maca m a c a is a root that that looks like a turnip. 
that grows at very, very high altitudes. So, you know, 13, 14, 15,000 foot altitude in the Andes Mountains. And when you dry it, you then grind it into flour, and it's one of the great superfoods, very high in protein, uh, rich in um, minerals, and, and it contains novel compounds that really enhance energy and stamina in a kind of a big way, mm-hmm. uh, and also are very significantly uh, vitalizing for sex and reproduction. So. It, there's great interest in maca, and it tastes good too. So it gets used in uh, supplements. It gets used in, um, you know, baked goods up there, drinks of all different kinds, uh, blender shakes. It, it's really lovely stuff. And in the market here, um, you see it appear as a powder to to add to like a a blender shake. Uh, you also have concentrated extracts of it in uh, in capsule form, and you have sort of like thick syrup extracts of it as well. But but it has been an enormous, um, you know, uh, before '98, maca didn't really sell outside of Peru, yeah. and what uh, the people I've worked with, you know, and I over the past 20 years have been able to do is to take this agriculture that the the people in the Andes have and popularize this plant and help them to cultivate and export many, many, many hundreds of tons every year. And that has had uh, an enormously positive effect on, you know, their communities. They've got electricity. They've got school supplies. They've got medicine. They, you know, they have things they never had before. Some of them have vehicles, you know, like trucks and shit. I mean, it, <laughs> you know, their, their lives, their lives have been revolutionized and, and they're happier, you know. Wow. And the world, wow. the world has this great, great superfood, and um, I get to be part of that. You know, putting that whole puzzle together. Wow, that's that's wow. so and cool. You 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 mentioned ayahuasca, obviously, and then you guys, you know, that's a big subject, and it's very popularized, sort of of late. Um, I have obviously a few questions about that, but maybe just start us into how your journey with with that particular medicinal plant uh, started? Well, I first read about ayahuasca, uh, which is a a psychoactive potion made from at least two plants uh, and is Amazonian in origin. I first read about it, I think, in 1975, uh, a book called The Wizard of the Upper Amazon. And I was spellbound about the accounts of this this brew that they drank for visionary journeying and it sounded really intense. And, um, and you know, I, I, I certainly possessed no connections to it or anything like that. And I actually started traveling in, uh, the Amazon in 97 and the first couple of times looked for ayahuasca and came really, really close, but just didn't get to it, which was unfortunate, or I thought at the time. Um, fast forward to about a, oh, 12 years ago or so, my mom died, and uh, I was really, really grief-stricken by that. And uh, I grieved for way too long, and I knew it was I knew I was in an unhealthy zone with it at a certain point. And I uh, made contact with a a friend, uh, Dennis McKenna, who I knew had some connections to to ayahuasca. And I I said, hey, you know, do you know somebody I can go to? Uh, I really need to help dealing with this. And he gave me a recommendation for a shaman in Peru. And I reached out to that person actually online and uh, (laughs) made plans to go there and did. And in my very first ceremony, my first time drinking ayahuasca, I uh, wound up suddenly sitting with my mother on a porch, just having a perfectly normal conversation. And when that conversation was over, the grief was gone and it never, Mm -hmm. ever came back. And that was the beginning of a, a very deep involvement 
um, with uh, ayahuasca, uh, something that I, I've you know spent a lot of time with and been with a lot of shamans and also have done with my wife Zoe, uh, you know, on and off for a good ten years, and we bring people down. Uh, to experience this medicine. So uh, it, it's it's really been a, um, a profound, profound journey. And I, I'm happy to go with, with this conversation anywhere you want to. Yeah, I mean, so, so can you, yeah, can you just tell us a bit more about like, I guess, the, the experience that you maybe had or that, that people do have? And I heard you um, talking on uh, Lana's podcast about there being almost sort of two worlds you have like the kind of world that we all live in and then there's another sort of more spiritual kind of other world you used obviously different words but uh it's really fascinating um well yeah. uh, you know uh, how the first night started off the shaman poured me a little bit of ayahuasca in a glass and uh, he said to me if it isn't strong enough, you can have more later. And I said, oh, you know, saying this in Spanish, I said, like, well, how much longer? He said, oh, you know, 45 minutes or an hour or so. If you're not feeling it, I'll give you more. And I was like, okay, okay. And about an hour later, I was on my back sobbing with laughter. <laughs> All in, right. com in complete disbelief that anybody would be idiot enough to drink more than what I had. <laughs> it, was, it was, it was so overwhelming and, you know, and, and I do have real history with psychedelics, but this was knock you down a flight of stairs mm -hmm. kind of like, wow. And the visions were fast and furious and, um, I was basically swept into a spirit landscape uh, you know, seeing the wheels of time and, and spirits galore and, you know, things just ar like entire celestial geometries and repeating wow. forms just appearing and then disappearing and being replaced by, you know, other remarkably colorful things. And uh, my my introduction to it was not only a, a profound healing in terms of the grief, but it was also intensely visionary, much more so than I experience now. Um, I don't really have so much of uh, days with ayahuasca, but back then it was full on. I mean, the, the second night that I was there, I drank three nights there. Uh, that was the first time I ever, ever experienced this. The second night I spent hours um, in the grips of a psychedelic anaconda that was wow. pounding, pounding my chest with energy so hard. I truly honestly thought I might come away with cracked ribs at the end of the night. Wow. It, it was like having some guy just like repeatedly punching the crap out of my chest. <laughs> wow. wow. <laughs> Were you actually feeling wow. it or just, it was... Oh yes. Oh yes. No oh way. yes. Oh yes. And, and, I had the next day. I had so much energy. I I, I could have run to Bolivia. I mean, it was ridiculous. <laughs> it was ridiculous. So so you know this this medicine. Uh, I mean, it's not always visionary like that. Uh, people don't necessarily always have an immediate healing. Um, sometimes it may take longer. But but you know, uh, I've found in my experience now with a great many shamans uh, down there, that this is a profound medicine that can help a lot of people, especially with mental and emotional traumas, with grief, with uh, unresolved, um, you know, health conditions that don't seem to respond to anything else. All of that, this is very, very powerful, very powerful. I think some people can go rather deep in terms of sitting with oneself, meditating and what have you to find themselves. But I think one thing with something like uh, ayahuasca is that it's a guaranteed journey to, to somewhere at the very least. And, and that's obviously uh, a big difference with, with that, something like that, which is, is very powerful. But people talk about having a bad experience and we've spoken about some of the visionary stuff. 
what does that mean to to or have a bad trip or have a bad experience is it does, is, does that exist or is that just part of the healing process well i i don't want to dismiss what people say i mean mm. a bad a bad experience is usually where you get the absolute hell scared out of you you know you you're scared that you may lose control you're scared that you may never come back you're scared that this is too overwhelming you're scared that you didn't sign up for this level of intensity i mean a- a- any of those things can happen and um you know it's understandable uh if you drink if you drink concentrated well-made ayahuasca which is made from a vine called copy or banisteriopsis copy with enough of the leaf chacruna which can is rich in dmt if you drink enough of it you'll have a strong psychedelic experience and while i would say that the greatest majority of people i've been around fare very well with it mm. every once in a while somebody just has an experience of the guy, this is too much for me. I can't do this. I don't want to do this again. This is not, not fun. You know, I'm not, and, and, you know, I respect that everybody is very different. I mean, I've, I have seen over time a very few people, but a few people nonetheless who drank, they did not like the experience. They didn't want to do it again. Um, but I would, also say that the majority of people who drink repeatedly have um they have nights and ceremonies that can be very difficult mm. when you're um releasing old traumas when you're releasing uh, old stories when when you're uh, facing fears and hurts and disappointments and upsets and, you know, the, the, the hazardous and challenging and painful stuff of life, um, that's not necessarily pleasant. Often mm. at the other side, there is that kind of, you know, pot of gold, if you will. But, but people go through difficult experiences. So um, I think it's a fair assessment. You know, ayahuasca's ayahuasca is rougher than let's say mushrooms ayahuasca Mm. ayahuasca can be quite rough and um it's not for everybody but for those who have been healed by it it, there's really nothing like it on earth and um sure so so the 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 main reason that people do it it's like a cleansing thing is that is that the main thing or is there not Mm. a main thing is there a few things I would say that the majority of people who approach ayahuasca do do so to be healed of something that is mental or emotional. Yeah. Um, and I would say that physical health, health needs, I mean, you know, as they get expressed, uh, stomach problems, sleep problems, um, uh, skin disorders, that kind of thing, they sort of fall into that package very often. Um, some people approach ayahuasca because, uh, they're spiritually curious about it. And, and it is fair to say that, you know, I mean, I, I've practiced yoga pretty much daily for like 48 years and, and yoga is steady and consistent and incremental and helps to clarify and strengthen and energize you and focus you more and more over time. Whereas ayahuasca is intense and rapid and radical and thorough and the combination of the two, um, taking the yogic skills, the meditative skills, uh, into that ceremonial space, that's very, very helpful for having, um, a good experience. You know, you, Mm -hmm. one of the things that's, it's paradoxical, you have to know how to let go. If you're having a completely overwhelming experience, there is only one thing to do that won't make you miserable, and that's to completely surrender. <laughs> e- e- everything else is going to be a bad time. Everything else is going to be a bad time. Yeah, wow. totally. Now, you mentioned other psychedelics a moment ago, and I remember in South Africa, friends of mine, uh, you, could, you could find um, a cactus and make mescaline. Um, and obviously you mentioned mushrooms and there's, there's a ton of others. Tell us a little bit about what a psychedelic is and, and how do they differ and 
just out of my own interest, uh, mescaline was something I've always been interested to hear. Is there like a healing aspect to that or is that purely just, or is there, with all psychedelics, is there that healing spiritual component or is it only certain ones? Well, I, I would say to you that um, as a category, I mean, as a category, psychedelic means mind manifesting. It was a term uh, developed by a British psychiatrist named Humphrey Osmond in 1957. And it, and it really stuck because it's a good description. Uh, just manifesting mind opening up you know much much broader imagination and access to everything that the mind can possibly be um and so you have things like the magic mushrooms uh you have uh mescaline which comes from from peyote cactus mm. but it also comes from san pedro cactus and what's odd in the u.s is that it's illegal to buy or sell peyote but you can go to any garden store in yeah. my <laughs> san pedro so um which is not legal illegal to buy or sell and and in is certainly in the southwestern united states everybody's got san pedro growing around their garden because <laughs> it's pretty and it's durable and in the spring it has beautiful flowers so um but but there are you know the psychedelic class the true psychedelics that 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 cause visions are actually a pretty small class of plants um you know you you certainly do have ayahuasca you have the magic mushrooms you have peyote you have san pedro you have an african plant called iboga um, you have some headline plants salvia divinorum is another mm -hmm. one um but in answer to your question about the mescaline what I've come to really appreciate is that it is your intent that has mm. so much to do with what happens. Um, when I was a teenager, our intent was to have a good experience, but mm. that was pretty much as far as we got. So, hey, like, it's a beautiful summer, summer day. Why don't we go to the beach? You know, we'll be sure to bring water and fruit and we'll drop acid and we'll go to that part that's pretty mm. far away from everybody and we'll hang out. Yeah. Um, you know, that that is different than the intention, for example, of going to an old lady shaman up in the hills of southern and and eating a dozen pairs of magic mushrooms and then performing a healing ceremony mm. with her very different right. yeah. um and so i i think that that a lot of a lot of it is was what your intention is i mean um i make and tend fires at gatherings here uh big parties and and uh you know people coming together and i will make san pedro tea and after i get the fire going i'll drink the san pedro for much of the evening and and the fire becomes a ceremony for me i'm very intentional about it um and and in those instances you look at the people who get uh healings from peyote which again addresses the mescaline issue or san pedro there's no question that these are great medicines um that many people have had their lives improved by consuming them in in um you know ritualized intentional healing settings mm -hmm. uh and and you know my wife and i have sat in um peyote ceremonies in the native american church uh, here and listened to many people talk about recovering from alcoholism and other forms of drug abuse and um uh, from depression and from traumas of different kinds by following the peyote way. So, so surely right. that's, that's a great, great, great proud medicine for sure. Right. Yeah. Wow. So, I mean, the thing that I think people struggle with is, is that like they still see these sort of things as like drugs, you know what I mean? It's like, you know, this is like, I might as well take cocaine if I'm if I'm going to take ayahuasca, which is completely not, um, you know, not not the same thing. Um, how right. do, how do we normalize this? Because well, and and maybe you can answer it with a, with a different sort of answer by talking about some of the 
the benefits you've seen people have from you know going to ayahuasca ceremonies or other ceremonies well for for one thing i've never seen anybody healed of anything by snorting lines of coke <laughs> yeah that's true yeah it's that's true but it's it's you know what i mean like people the way they think about it yeah but yeah. but yeah i mean you know people who don't know about something imagine all kinds of erroneous mm, things true. um you know ayahuasca when i say drink ayahuasca i don't mean swallow a liquid i mean sit in a ceremonial setting with somebody trained and have a conscious intentional journey that's designed around wholeness and cleansing and improved realization and greater sensitivity and deeper understanding and a better capacity to appreciate you know the wonders of life and all of that i don't just mean swallowing something and and mm. and, and 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 you know you can buy chemicals that you can mix up in your kitchen that will give you the chemical experience of ayahuasca. They won't give you sitting in the jungle. They won't give you sitting with a shaman or many shamans who are highly trained to sing uh, rhythmic hypnotic songs that help you to have the healing journey that you need to have to accomplish whatever you want to accomplish. You know, they don't have this handcrafted, painstakingly made beautiful ayahuasca that, you know, <laughs> somebody who that's their job that's what they do, you know, hmm. made that the day before and it was an intense labor and it took hours and hours and hours, you know, and they don't necessarily also have the preparation leading up to the ceremony and the, the, you know, the creating of the ceremonial space and all of that is the experience, all of that. And so, you know, when one of the things that we do in, in our, so-called first world cultures is we we take drugs okay taking drugs has nothing to do with engaging in a healing ceremony whether it's an ayahuasca ceremony or it's a native american church peyote ceremony or it's a san pedro ceremony or for that matter it's a you know a ceremony with himalayan hashish and holy music that goes on for hours and hours and hours in some remote temple, you know. Um, the, it, consuming substances does not get close to the wholeness of those experiences. Yeah, yeah, and I yeah. mean, yeah. I, I, I actually um, took uh, ayahuasca when I was in Peru. I was in the Amazon for like five days, and it was... It was exactly what you're explaining now. Like, it was incredible. Like, we had this shaman, and he, I don't know how he did it, but he flipping whistled. Who was that? Uh, I, I can't tell you. Um, okay. But okay. It, was, it was literally like, it was a proper, proper guy. You know what I mean? Um, it, sure. It was a sure, very small sure. ceremony. There was three of us, and it's, I mean, the, the shaman didn't speak any English or anything like that. He was, but it was really incredible, and um but he, he like whistled for like, it felt like five hours. I mean, it was crazy. Yeah. I don't know how he did it. Yeah. And, and like you said, it's yeah. the whole environment which which really sort of encapsulates you and adds to that experience. And it was right. quite phenomenal, I must say. And um, Oh, yeah. Yeah, I, I, would, I would love to come on a trip with you guys, you know, because you obviously... Um, you know, have lots of experience, and you know, you know the the right people and where to go well, and you, stuff. Well, you you would both certainly be welcome to do so. You know, hey, can, do I get to plug my book here? Yeah, for of sure, you can you plug do. everything you want. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's the point. <laughs> that's why we here, yeah, but I have a, I have a book called the Ayahuasca Test Pilots Handbook, uh, and the subtitle is the Essential Guide to Ayahuasca Journeying. I realized after a few years of drinking, people have hundreds of questions. Yeah. Mm. So I basically put this together as a guidebook 
so that people could get their, <clears throat> you know, get the basic information about ayahuasca and also, you know, uh, know kind of what to expect and what to look for when they decide to engage in drinking ayahuasca. But I'm glad you had such a, a very positive experience. That's, you know, that's wonderful. How did you find this shaman? Was it just good fortune? Yeah, literally it was like my friend and I, we, we just, we booked this trip and we flew into a Kitos and then we got a, a boat, a, the boat, it was like miles away. It was like a two hour boat trip into the deep jungle. And we had this amazing, um, guide, Eddie, I'll never forget him. He's one of the, mm. the smartest guys I've ever met in my entire life. And he like, he knew everything about the jungle. He literally he took us on these crazy walks in the jungle and like he would pick up plants and go, yeah, I have this and or whatever. And you'd, and you'd, I don't know. He was just amazing. You know what I mean? Uh -huh. he, he was just incredible. Um, and he just said to us one night, he's like, well, you know, would you guys like to try? And we were like, yeah, definitely. <laughs> uh, why not? Um, so we didn't do the whole preparation. How are you supposed to, you know, but still we had, um, very profound, um, uh, effects of it you know yeah it was it yeah. was really it was really rather incredible but i would like to go through it in a more um not structured way but the more sort of uh you know uh the way where you're supposed to uh ha eat say like a vegetarian and you know uh not have sex yeah. and all these sort of things and um then really get the positive the, the you know the positive effect well you know i i i i have to say that um I've seen a lot of people who have done none of the dietary stuff and none of the preparatory stuff, myself included, yeah. who have had life-changing experiences with ayahuasca. I, I'm honestly not, I mean, as somebody who's done it both ways, yeah. frankly, I, I am not entirely convinced that um, the preparation in all instances is even necessary. Okay, cool. I think if people have really toxic diets and that kind of thing, it, it's a good idea to, to, yeah. you know, to clean out, to be a little bit more pure and all of that. But I would also, uh, I just have to say, I mean, you know, the first time I drank ayahuasca and had one of the greatest experiences ever with that remarkable plant medicine, I had broken pretty much every prescription there was. So, um, <laughs> you know, <laughs> just not, not really knowing it, yeah. not really knowing mm -hmm. that. Uh, and, and I think that, you know, a lot of times the native people, uh, I mean, you look at the native people, they're, you know, they're just eating what they're eating and doing what they're doing. And periodically they drink ayahuasca and they do just fine. So I'm not totally sold on all of the preparation. Plus, everybody contradicts everybody else. You know, yeah. people don't eat oil. These people don't eat salt. These people don't eat this. It, it, it's, <laughs> it's all over the place. It's all <laughs> over the place. Wow. Well, Chris, you've, you've met so many I mean, interesting people on your journeys. I can only imagine, and we're just, you know, sc t scratching the surface here of your of your journeys. Um, when you went to, you were in South Africa, as far as I understand. Yeah, um, yeah. Was that was that sort of for this kind of a, an experience? And did you get to meet an Inyanga or a, a Sangoma medicine person there in South Africa? Well, okay. Um, this the trip to South Africa actually served two functions. First of all, it was a, a work trip for me to investigate um, hudia, which is a cactus that you know showed some promise for helping people to control their weight. It turned out not to work out so great, but in any case, I was there uh, for that, and it was also Zoe's and my um, uh, honeymoon. <laughs> so we were in, we were in South Africa for two weeks, and we had a lovely, lovely experience. Um, we did not meet traditional healers. We spent some time with some sand people, who cool. uh, told us a, a good amount about um, the sand tradition of medicine. Um, <clears throat> but we also went around to people involved with Hudia you know, throughout the Cape Town area, up into mm. the series Karoo, right. between those two. Um, and um, it was, and in the process, we wound up meeting people who knew a lot about other plants, like 
scalidium, for example, are what you call kaud, which uh, is a profoundly powerful, um, rapid, mind-enhancing succulent that you have in South Africa. You just put a little bit in your mouth, and in about a half hour, your brain is like a twelve-cilinder <laughs> ether-fueled Formula <laughs> A racing engine. It's ridiculous. Wow. It's just amazing. Wow, and, that's um, incredible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And 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 so we actually spent uh, a good deal of time really going as deeply as we could into um, meeting people who were involved in producing medicinal plants mm. or, or preparations of them one way or another. And I would very much have liked to get to some traditional healers. We, the contacts that we had did not lead us to that. Oh, yeah. yeah. Well, just briefly on the sand people, I mean, you were talking about, Gareth, about the knowledge base of the people in the Amazon. The sand people are also just Oh, yeah. like mind-blowingly in tune with nature like yeah. there's not much where they live in a lot of these places and it's yeah. and they will find candles from some root and they'll find like the follow animals and they'll tell what the wind will do tomorrow by looking at the stars and like it's just ridiculous right. how in tune these people are and we, I, I feel so when you speak to people like that you feel how disconnected we are with nature in, in many respects in the modern world, hey? Well, not only that, but we don't even understand the extent of that disconnection. Mm -hmm. I mean, these are, these are people who have direct, intentional, clear communication with the forces of nature. And, I mean, I remember one time in the Amazon, I met this woman and she uh, she said, I, I want to, I want to read you. Hey, wait a minute. And she went, and she got this tiny, tiny little plant and she sat me down and she touched me all over with the plant. And then she told me about this very specific circumstance I had in my work that she couldn't possibly have known oh. about. Uh, she'd gotten no introduction to me whatsoever. And, um, and I said, how do you know this? And she goes, oh, oh I don't know this. And she, she pointed to the plant. She said, see, it has its roots, right? The plant knows. I touch you with the plant. The plant sends it here. And then it goes here. Now do you understand? And I was like, yeah, now I understand. Sure. Now I get it. Uh, uh, classic. classic. So, so we have lost... <laughs> So much direct connection. You know, um, I listened to, to a man who captained the group that that recreated the Polynesian journey. It took took decades to accomplish this. And he spent 12 years learning the um, the old navigation from the one person left on Earth who knew it. and And he described how, Learning what he did, he could just look at the texture of water someplace in the ocean and say, two days from now, storm from the northeast. Oh, wow. You know, just uh, that the whole thing was this completely integrated piece of water that you could read like a fingerprint. And, you know, we don't know how to do that. I don't know how to do yeah. that. I mean, I spend a lot of time on the sea in a kayak, but I don't know how to do that. Not like that. And, and so I think that there are many natural skills, whether it's people who can scamper up a 60 foot palm to knock down some coconuts because yeah. you're thirsty or <laughs> or a woman who can take a little plant with a with roots wow. and, and read a circumstance in your life that she couldn't know about. Um, these are skills we have lost. There's mm -hmm. a there's a wonderful um, up in the Andes the women read coca leaves. So oh. coca, you know, that, that contains a tiny little bit of cocaine. Yeah. They'll have a bag of coca leaves and they'll pull them out and they'll they'll look at them and they'll they'll tell you something. Wow. And <laughs> I was up there with um, <clears throat> my wife and and this woman pulled this group of leaves out of a um, a bag. This is December. And she looked and she said, oh, you're coming back really soon. <laughs> and I said, well, actually, no, I probably won't be back here for about six months or so. And she said, no, no, you're coming back soon. And another woman leaned over and looked and said, oh, yeah, yeah, you're coming back almost right away. <laughs> and, and, and I didn't 
I didn't want to piss them off, okay? You know, these are two <laughs> these are two little old lady shamans. And I said, Well, that's very nice. <clears throat> we got home. About two days later, the phone rang. It was the New York Times, a guy saying, I want to do a story on you and Maka, and I need to go back to Peru with you right away. <laughs> no way, but <laughs> so, so three three day three three weeks after we left there. Oh wow. We're back there and these little old ladies are standing there with their hands on their hips going, We told you so. <laughs> Why didn't you believe us? We told you you were coming oh, back. Classic. So, the coca leaves told us so <laughs> there is magic in this world wow, wow. but yeah so uh, how did you say sorry to them <laughs> <laughs> i just did what i do with little old ladies i kissed them on the cheeks and gave them a big hug yeah. and that was yeah. you know, i uh, you know i, I accept you? that they know something yeah, yeah. Wow, Chris, jeez, man, your stories are incredible. And you know what? We haven't even touched the surface of any of them. Um, but, you know, I guess in the interest of, of your time, uh, we we kind of need to wrap things up. And, you know, what? Um, just to finish it off, so, like, what is the best way for people to get hold of you? And also, what, like, cool things are you working on now and you know, you've, we know you've published like 14 books, so feel free to plug anything you want. Um, well, if people want to know more about what I'm up to, uh, they can go on to medicinehunter.com. It's a great website, um, and they'll find all kinds of, you know, videos there and plenty about medicinal plants and plenty about psychoactive plants. Um, right now, I'm working on a survey uh, in the Amazon on um, wild harvesting and cultivation of ayahuasca vine. Uh, so I'll be back there in a couple of weeks continuing that survey. I've got uh, lectures scheduled in Geneva and uh, North Carolina and different places upcoming. But mostly the projects I'm doing right now involve some work in India with the uh, energy enhancing plant ashwagandha hmm. and work in the Amazon with the psychedelic plants uh, combination ayahuasca. So uh, that and, and uh, going around doing seminars and educating people about medicinal plants is keeping me pretty busy. And uh, thankfully, Zoe manages to uh, catch things like uh, you guys wanting to talk while I'm <laughs> out there running around doing an inadequate <laughs> job of communicating. <laughs> a good com a good team effort there. <laughs> oh, absolutely, absolutely, the best. And uh, well, let me just say from my side, Chris, it's been an absolute pleasure. Uh, literally, like Eric said, there's way too much that we just didn't even get to. Pirates, sustainability, organics. I mean, the, the <laughs> list is literally endless. Um, but you are a really cool guy to chat to, and we've learned a lot. And obviously, this is just going to spark a lot more interest and questions in, in, in both of our minds, I'm pretty sure. But uh, just briefly, just thank you so much. And uh, thank you for sharing uh, this knowledge and information and your stories. It's just uh, you are a great storyteller. So keep that up. And uh, we really are excited to see all the stuff that you're busy with. So thanks again from my side. Well, thank you so much, Craig. Thank you, Gareth. It's been a real pleasure to be on with both of you. I appreciate it very much, and uh, I'll look for it. I'll, now that I uh, know what you guys are up to, I'll keep close tabs on it. <laughs> awesome stuff. Cool, Thanks. Chris. And, and just from my side, but um, yeah, wow. It's all I can say. I'm just sitting here like with the massive smile on my face, and that was all started off by the start of the chats when you came on with a massive yeah. smile, and I was like, <laughs> yeah, this is going to be a good chat. So, yeah, it was truly fascinating, you know. Um, thanks for sharing your knowledge and for just opening up, like, my mind, you know, when it came to all these things and, like, sparked this serious interest. I've always been interested in plants and, and you know, and nature and stuff, but now I'm like... Flip, I want to come do this. <laughs> you know what I mean? You should like come a, with us. Yeah, you just, should come with us to the Amazon. Yeah, they just, there's yeah. just so much to learn. And, and I love what you said about there's a big disconnect in terms of what we don't know. You know, like 
And mm. that void needs to be filled and it's being filled by you at the moment. And I'm sure there's, there's some other people out there, but oh, it's, yeah. it's, ama- oh, yeah. it's amazing like what you're doing. So thank you for doing that, you know, like on behalf of humanity, because we're going through this amazing stage now as well with where technology is advancing and it's giving us these all these cool things as well. But at the same time, we need to remember where we came from and we um, do all the old traditions and stuff and somehow meet in the middle. Do you know what I mean? Um, mm, I do. Yeah. So it's just been an amazing chat. We're so happy to connect with you and we're rooting for you and we're going to definitely be watching you and everything you do too. Cause it's, it's really inspiring and amazing. So well, appreciate bless it, buddy. you guys. Bless you guys. Thanks, Thank you. Yeah. Thanks man. So, so yeah. So, Great. so cool, but that was an amazing chat. So like, let's just.